at the link I'm looking at for anyone that's uh, looking at these sites at the moment is I'm going to go to hash one deed which is on the right hand side it's the fifth last link when you go to how to save your home and you look at the list of pages on the right hand side hash one deed if you open up hash one deed it says step one deed of rights and possession and then it goes through and it shows a number of different documents that are associated with uh, preparing your uh, claim and your claim of rights and possession now I just want to talk about two documents that are at the bottom there and I'll let you guys go through and read the rest one is the certificate of vacant possession and occupancy and the other is the certificate of survey and title so on the certificate of vacant possession and occupancy uh, I would love you guys just to open that up as I will and just have a look at it and then I want to go through and explain a bit about this structure now this is still being set up so please I know people are keen uh, it is being built it's been coming together and there's going to be a number a number of questions so please please don't email me on this please don't email me give me a chance to finish this use the forums as the uh, opportunity to to talk but know that all the questions that you're most likely to ask like what is an AU number what's it what's a national cadastra what's a cadastra all these questions when you open this up are going to be answered and some of them are going to be answered by me now so this is a certificate of vacant possession and occupancy you cannot claim your property your land land and property unless it is vacant possession that is unless the land was abandoned by the previous tenant and if you've been living there for some time then you can establish quite a right that in fact it was abandoned and that uh, by the time of making the certificate clearly it was abandoned the other thing is uh, occupancy which we spoke of which is uh, this claim of uh, conquering of land now another issue and this is something that people have raised over and over and they're right to have raised that when you discuss things like suburbs cities zip codes you're really claiming to belong to some higher trust and that's exactly what they get you to do so when you look at the right hand side of this document you see a number of things you see land register number you see survey and title then you see something that says region cadastra trust number now first question is what's cadastra I'm going to have a look at Wikipedia what a cadastra is but cadastra is a comprehensive register of meets and bounds and title and geographic information so the cadastra is all the technical information that goes with a land title system it's like the big uh, brother that brings it all together that's what cadastra means so when you see cadastra you are by default claiming that you have a system which we do for identifying accurately the meets and bounds the terrain the survey of the land and title and all the attendant documents that go with it the so regional cadastral trust then belongs to a national cadastral trust that belongs to a union location trust now just by identifying those levels we make clear that this land and property is wholly outside of their system but in a system nonetheless now moving forward uh, you'll see that the paragraph the first paragraph let it be known and so on and then there are two important paragraphs underneath number two and number three number two makes clear that the land is being claimed lawfully by vacant possession number three extremely important is also making clear that the land and property is lawfully occupied and derived it says reconveyance it should only be called conveyance so I apologize these are some of the things will be fixed not reconveyance but conveyance and survey all property rights away from the Roman cult so 
uh, it should be claims or property claims. So these things will be tidied up. Um, again, I'm sorry that these typos and things haven't been cleared up. But the purpose of this third paragraph is to say that they cannot claim the land is being occupied anymore because the rights of occupancy have been conveyed away. Their claims have been conveyed away. And the evidence of that is precisely what the top of the document proves. Because these trusts exist and there are numbers and it's structured and it's ordered, of course we can prove by that that the land and property has been conveyed away. And if they don't have occupancy, then they lose the second key part of the Roman system. I know some of this is going to be new to you, but when you read the history and you read other people's comments, I'm sure you'll find that if they've done the research, that there is a concordance with what we're saying. Okay, I'm going to move to the next document. And I'm going to move to Certificate of Survey and Title. And open that one up. Okay, so Certificate of Survey and Title. We'll see the same sort of information, although instead of saying uh, survey, it says possession and occupancy and puts a number. It has a similar sort of opening. But it has some interesting words, and I'm going to go through them. There are two paragraphs again. The first is, paragraph two, surveys the land, and it calls it as a sacred close of land, a sacred close of land. Close is an extremely important word, Latin word. Uh, and what this describes in the second paragraph is that we can describe from the America's Union in this example down to the plot, which might be your land, 123 Main or whatever the plot is, that we can define wholly separate to their system that the land has been surveyed. Extremely important. So one of the arguments that they might say is, well, you can claim all this, but have you surveyed it? Well, in this paragraph second, the fact that we issue a certificate of survey and title, yes, we have surveyed. Now, given that the Romans only surveyed the role and didn't go out and do the legwork, they can't claim that there is some ancient rule of surveying right throughout the entire state and putting their little markets. Now, we will do that. We will absolutely do that. But for the purpose of saving your home, we don't have to go to that extent. Now, point three. This is the kind of language, and it's an example that needs to be tied up even further, but this is the kind of language to give an understanding of how you make your land sacred and how you make your land and property untouchable by law, untouchable by law. If they come to seize you and take your land, it is not lawful, it is piracy, thievery, robbery. And let's be clear that this ends the charade that what they do is lawful. So we begin, we go to the northeastern corner of the property. A sacred monument was found to be erected. Very important words. In honour, and the honour could be in honour of um, Mary, in honour of my son, or in honour of whomever or whatever. A monument is significant to you and it's significant in how it's, how it's looked. I mean, a monument can simply be a post with a number on it or it could be a post with a carving on it or it could be a piece of stone or it could be an old telephone pole. It could be anything. What makes it significant is when you place a significance on it. Now, when we do the survey, we don't say we placed that there. What we say correctly is it was found. Now, when it's found at four points of your property and you have four sacred monuments and you walk the boundaries of your property and survey, you can have a fifth if you want to perfect it and that's your post. When you walk the boundaries, you have circumscribed and closed your property to any claim of the Roman system, absolutely. You have absolutely closed. Now when they break it, 
they are breaking their most fundamental rules. Okay, now I know there's going to be a ton of questions and we're going to go through stuff, but I just want to sh show that. Now, I want to talk to you about RITs in the time available and, as I said, quickly about saving a helping community. I'm just going to have a quick drink, one sec, and we'll talk about RITs. One sec. Now, I know that we've spoken about the great RITs coming up onto the system. I know that a number of you have issues such as family members in prison, and uh, actions that are unlawful. But the time and the patience of doing this properly will pay out by doing it properly for this reason. Understand the significance of the bedrock and root of their system. A writ is absolutely the bedrock and root of their system. So when we talk about a writ, writs used to be called what's called forms of action. And they were called forms of action up until the 19th century until the Bar Association was created and they were dissolved. So from 1213, when uh, King John of England gave up all the land of England and unlawfully Ireland to the Pope to create the, con the first model of feudalism, from that time, writs have been an intrinsic part of the introduction of the guild courts from Venice. They were also invented in Florence and Genoa. And the, the writ being a form of action uh, gives explanation. So form, formo, Latin, to shape, fashion, actus, plead, discuss, negotiate, treat. So shape, a plead, or to fashion, a discussion. So a rule was set in motion from 1213 and still holds true in the system today. A cause of action which is a court case, cannot begin without a form of action, a writ. No writ, no case. So a writ creates the cause, and if a writ does not exist, the matter cannot be brought before the court. Now that symbiotic relationship holds true today, as it did back in 1213 when it was, it was first introduced. Now, a cause cannot exist without a form. A cause of action is invalid if the form of action is invalid. What does that mean? Well, if a writ is defective in a court case, the court action is by definition defective, regardless of how it was, it was handled. If the writ is defective, the case is defective. Now, I'd suggest to you that the vast majority of writs issued today are defective. Well, let's get into it a bit deeper. A writ is supposed to memorialise the plea that is the uh, form of the action that is then going to move forward. But the plea is a misdirection because the origin and the true word, even today, used by the prosecution, is prayer. Remember, plea and prayer seem to be uh, interactive, but they don't want you to understand that prayer is the element that goes to a writ. Now, a writ comes from writers, and it comes from the concept of a holy rite. And the form, not only needed the prayer to be valid, but it needed the seal, the seal of authority to issue it because there is the uh, old ancient saying that a writ not issued by the king means no action can be brought before the king's courts. In other words, if it's not sealed properly, it will not be recognised as a valid uh, creator of a course of action. It won't be. So the seal was all important. Now, the name they gave to the seal of a writ was interesting. We know the word today as warrant. But the meaning is lost. The meaning was indemnity. So the word, there is no W in Latin. 
So the word almost certainly comes back to uh, vacuus, uh, back to the concept of empty or indemnity. 